Good morning. Welcome to worship. Glad you're here today. Happy Father's Day to the fathers who are present, the grandfathers, the um, you know, the uncles, the teachers, to the moms who serve both roles, to all of those who serve as a father figure in somehow, some way. Thank you and happy Father's Day. Glad you're here today. Uh, some announcements as we start our time. Once again, I'm Pastor Eric Young. On behalf of our church staff and our church council, we are very glad that you are here today. If there's anything you need, please see myself or any of the other church council members. We will do our best to help out. Uh, church council members who are present, will you show of hands? Do we have a... Okay, these are the people to blame for things, so go see them. <laughs> um, next slides. Uh, Okay, I just got a whole, folks, I got a list of things for you this morning. You can, you can groan, it's okay. Um, uh, church office is going to be closed on Wednesday because it is Juneteenth. For those of you who don't know what Juneteenth is, look it up. It was two years after uh, the end of the Civil War that word finally got to the last uh, black slaves. They were slaves for two years after their, their freedom were, was pronounced. So Juneteenth is a celebration of that true independence. So we do celebrate that with our uh, African-American brothers and sisters. Um, graduation Sunday is next Sunday. So if you are or have a graduate um, of high school, college, uh, please get their picture and information into the church office this week so we can have that displayed up here. Uh, next weekend is also Blessing of the Quilts. It is one of my favorite Sundays of the year where this place gets beautiful. Uh, so you know that we're at quilt number 9,300 plus. So I'm told that they're planning on hitting the 10,000 mark next year. So that will be something to celebrate. So we are really grateful for that ministry. And if you have any questions about that ministry, uh, for those who are in the quilting group, will you raise your hand, please? Okay, talk to these folk. Um, it really is a neat ministry. Um, if you want to help out any way, they can tell you things. Folks, you don't need to know how to work a sewing machine. You can learn, but there's lots of things you can be doing as part of that group. So reach out to them and talk to them about that ministry. We are collecting a couple different things right now. Uh, obviously, we collect food for uh, the Blessing Box, and what's coming is the food pantry. We also uh, are collecting um, shoes. The Boy Scouts are collecting lightly used pairs of shoes. So if you've got some good shoes that you really don't wear anymore, drop them off. They make sure that they get to people who need them. But we also are collecting for Lutheran World Relief uh, the health kits, what we do every summer. So please, if you want to give in some way, there's more opportunities if you're called to give in that way. Um, I will be leaving today at 1 o'clock to go to confirmation camp with six of our youth. Um, so you all pray for me. Uh, <laughs> If you are interested or able to be on the lawn mowing team and can sign up for one week a month, you can tell that we sort of need it. We have people who can do it. Please talk to our property committee, which uh, talk my uncle. So John Erickson is uh, one of the people you'll want to reach out to. If you don't have his number, reach out to the church office. We'll get you connected so that way you can sign up to be part of that lawn mowing group. Uh, you notice that we have a flower on the altar. Uh, that is because we have a new birth among us. Um, uh, Ross and Kristen, uh, I'm sorry, Nate and Kristen, Ro Kristen Ross had baby Wyndham this week. Uh, and he is little brother to Wesley. So Eric and Pam Zach have a new grandchild. So we, we celebrate with them that life that has come into our community. Last but not least, um, well, for the moment, uh, we just got back from Synod Assembly yesterday. Uh, Rick, Mary Hetrick, myself, and Caleb, uh, we were at Synod Assembly where all the churches of our 13 um, uh, counties that represent the Northwest Pennsylvania Synod get together and conduct bigger church business. Um, Mary's going to give us a little report on that right now. <laughs> Thank you, Pastor. So the theme of the Synod Assembly was, I love to tell the story. So here is my story for you. Rick and I both graduated from Teal College. He two years ahead of me. So we were very new to this kind of forum 
And after we got our smartphones processed through the tech screening, we joined Pastor Eric and Caleb um, for the opening worship. As the day progressed, we voted on several Synod Council recommendations, including a slight increase in the compensation for rostered leaders and deacons. Several openings of the, on the Synod Council were, fi were filled and the budget was passed. We heard many reports, one from Bishop Lozano and many different synodical committees. My favorite was the Vocations Committee report where we hear about um, the new seminarians and the team candidates. I did not know what a fan Bishop Lozano was of dad jokes. We enjoyed his jokes during the times when the tech handled issues. We did hear from a representative from the ELCA and I think she had the best dad joke. She said, why don't skeletons climb mountains? They don't have the guts. <laughs> we watched video greetings from Bishop Eaton and we saw many familiar faces and met new people. There was even an appearance by a blue dinosaur, which might have been Pastor Eric. <laughs> St. Paul's is proud to have Pastor Eric assisting with organizing our Synod youths um, going to the National Youth Gathering in July, and he was commissioned um, as Synod champion to go there. And now we need to be proud of Caleb as well. He did a great job representing our congregation as the 1% of youth attending the assembly. Caleb was nominated and approved to be on the six-person synodical delegation as a lay leader going to the Churchwide Assembly 2025, where a new ELCA bishop will be elected. So thank you, Caleb. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you for giving Rick and I this opportunity to St. Paul's and to visit our alma mater. Thanks. We send representatives to Synod Assembly every year, and so if that is something that interests you, uh, please talk to Rick and Mary, and they'll tell you what it's like and why it's worth going. So for those of you at home, welcome. We're glad you're here. There are announcements on Facebook. Uh, and when it comes time for passing of the peace, please share uh, that peace via text with those who are at home, those who aren't here today, and uh, make sure that you are welcoming one another in such a way. That being said, I do invite you at this point to take some time to transition from getting here to being here. I invite you to stand as we begin our worship in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. 
to the glory of your holy name. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray together. O oh God, you are the tree of life, offering shelter to all the world. Graft us into yourself and nurture our growth, that we may bear your truth and love to those in need. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let us now hear the word of God through our holy scriptures. Our first reading today is from the 17th chapter of Ezekiel. <coughs> Thus says the Lord God, I myself will take a sprig from the lofty top of a cedar. I will set it out. I will break off a tender one from the topmost of its young twigs. I myself will plant it on a high and lofty mountain. On the mountain height of Israel, I will plant it in order that it may produce boughs and bear fruit and become a noble cedar. Under it, every kind of bird will live. In the shade of its branches will nest winged creatures of every kind. All the trees of the field shall know that I am the Lord. I will bring low the high tree. I make high the low tree. I dry up the green tree and make the dry tree flourish. I, the Lord, have spoken. I will accomplish it. The word of the Lord. Our second reading is from the fifth chapter of 2 Corinthians. So we are always confident, even though we know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we do have confidence, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. For all of us must appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each may receive recompense for what has been done in the body, whether good or evil. 
Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we try to persuade others, but we ourselves are well known to God, and I hope that we are also well known to your consciences. We are not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you an opportunity to boast about us, so that you may be able to answer those who boast in outward appearance and not in, your, in the heart. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ urges us on, because we are convinced that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, so that those who live might live no longer for themselves, but for him who died and was raised for them. From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view, even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view, we know him no longer in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Well, according to St. Mark, the fourth chapter. Jesus said, The kingdom of God is as if someone would scatter seed on the ground and would sleep and rise night and day, and the seed would sprout and grow, and he does not know how. The earth produces of itself first the stalk, then the head, then the full grain of the head. But when the grain is ripe, at once he goes in with his sickle because the harvest has come. Jesus also said, with what can we compare the kingdom of God? Or what parable will we use for it? It is like a mustard seed, which when sown upon the ground is the smallest of all the seeds on earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes the greatest of all shrubs and puts forth large branches so that birds of the air can make nests in his shade. With many such parables, Jesus spoke the word to them and they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them except in parables, but he explained everything in private to his disciples. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Please be seated. Now usually when I ask you a question in a sermon, I, I literally set up the t-ball for you to swing at. Really easy stuff. What I'm about to ask you is not a t-ball question. This is, this is a little difficult. And I don't want you to say it out loud. I want you to come up with the answer to this in your head and hold on to it. What are the two things that Jesus talks about most? Think about that for a second. The two things Jesus talks about most, get those two things in your head. Give you another couple seconds. All right. What do you think they are? Love. Who here thinks it's love? Love. Folks, I had been a pastor for 15 years before I realized that it was not love. Love is down the list. He does talk about it, but it's down the list. Had no clue until a little over a decade ago. Money. money. That is one of them. Jesus talks about money, money, money. The other thing, anyone want to guess? Hey, very good. Where'd you get that one from? <laughs> Kingdom of God. Jesus talks about the money and kingdom of God more than anything else. Now, we understand when Jesus uses parables to talk about money. Because we as a community, we as a culture, well, we understand money. Our whole society is based on capitalism. And, you know, being able to go out and make money and, and buy things and sell things and make more money. And so we, we absolutely understand, you know, a financially focused society because we live in it. We understand that money does make the world go round. We also understand that money, the love of money, not money itself. Paul says the love of money is the root of all evil. We get that. We've seen when... 
the love of money has outweighed the love of people, and it, it haunts us a little bit, as it ought. So when Jesus tells parables about money, well, we can sort of understand that because it makes a little bit of sense to us from a cultural perspective. This, on the other hand, we don't get this. We don't necessarily understand this one because, well, kingdom. We're Americans. We don't live in a kingdom. We live in a democracy where my vote actually does matter despite what some of our culture says, where I, along with the people I'm surrounded by, can vote for something or someone, and consensus wins. Where the law of the land is not given by one person, but by us as a culture together, saying, yes, this is our law. This is what we are getting behind. And when we don't like a law that's been put in place by leadership that we have elected, we can remove that leadership by election, by our vote, and we can also change that law by consensus of the land where it goes on a ballot and we all vote for either in favor or against that law. We live in a democracy. It's amazing. We don't want a kingdom where one person rules everything or one family controls everything. Matter of fact, we don't want it so badly that about 250 years ago, a group of people went and pour, took some poor innocent tea and threw it into some water somewhere and said, get your kingdom out of here. We don't want it. Hence America. So when Jesus talks about kingdoms, we don't get it because it's not part of our fabric. It's not part of our culture. Back here in this time 2,000 years ago, the people Jesus was talking to understood kingdom. You see, they were historically from the kingdom of Israel or the kingdom of Judah, all part of the, the tribes you know, that, that were there originally from Abraham and down. And then they were attacked and taken over by the kingdom of Assyria and the kingdom of Babylon. And then they came back and as they were trying to reestablish their kingdom, some Roman people came down and go, no, you're part of our kingdom. And they fought for a lot of years and finally Rome, Rome was said, enough of your garbage. And they came in and suddenly they were part of the kingdom of Rome, the empire of Rome. This is something that the people understand. They understand the word kingdom. So how do we as Americans learn to understand kingdom? Well, easiest way is this. <coughs> what is a kingdom? Something that is controlled by someone. It is an area or an effect that is controlled or has um, some sort of influence over uh, by someone. You have a kingdom. You have an area that you have control over, that you have say over, that you have effect over. Example, your sock drawer. <laughs> you can decide what goes into that sock drawer. I'm not going to put socks in there. I'm going to put meatloaf. That's your choice. You can decide whether the socks are going to go into that drawer or not. You can decide um, how the socks are going into that drawer, whether you're going to put them in little sock balls, or you're going to put them in long sock tubes, or you're just going to dump all just single socks in there and pick them out as they go. Now, some of you I just saw visibly twitch on that one. <laughs> you can decide to order them by color or size or style or brand. That's your sock drawer. That's your kingdom. You have control over that space. Your shopping cart. As you go through the store, you have control over what goes into that shopping cart, unless you have a toddler. Um, and you go through that whole area and you decide what you're going to pay for, what you're going to buy this week, what you don't want, don't need, what you can or cannot afford. That is your kingdom, that shopping cart, your dinner plate. That's your kingdom. Because you can decide what goes onto that plate and what you do with what goes onto that plate. Now, some of you are going, have you met my kid? <laughs> Parents, grandparents, a little psychology for you. If you ask a child, do you want peas for dinner, what's usually going to be the answer? No. no. Now, we as adults don't necessarily want peas for dinner either, but 
we understand the value of peas and what it, what it means for our bodies. And so you don't give the child a choice on whether they want peas on their plate. What you do is you say, where on your plate would you like your peas? I don't want peas. That wasn't an option for you. You're going to have peas, but you get to decide where on your plate they're going. But I don't want peas. I understand that. So you can either decide where on your plate they're going, or I can decide for you. Fine, right here. There they go. I'm not eating them. Well, that is your choice. And if you don't eat them, well, you don't get the ice cream later. I'm going to eat my peas, and I'm going to have ice cream. And if you eat your peas, you can have your ice cream too. Otherwise, you don't eat your peas, you don't get ice cream, and I'm going to enjoy my ice cream. So if you want ice cream, you're going to want to eat your peas. And I'm just going to tell you, they taste better when they're warm. The child has absolute control over that plate. They really do. Whether they eat or not, sometimes there are consequences, though, to those choices in that kingdom. Look at the French Revolution. That right there. Sometimes there's consequences to what happens on that plate. Folks, you have full authority and full ability to go 90 miles an hour on I-79 down to Pittsburgh. That is within your control. That is within your realm of ownership. Now, might there be consequences if you do that? Of course. The police officer behind you might tell you that, oh, no, you're in trouble. Sometimes there are consequences within that, but you have that choice, that ownership, that control, that effect. When we're talking about kingdom, I need you to think like that. Don't think king, you know, loyal subjects. Think of what do you have within your area of control? What is within your space that is within your realm? Now, we are talking about God's kingdom here. So let's ask the obvious questions. Let's set up the whole thing here. God. Where is God in... Anybody? Oh, everywhere. Okay, once again, this, these are the T-balls. Here we go. Everywhere. What does God have control over? Everything. Everything. Now, once again, we are God's children, correct? We don't get the choice of whether we get the peas. We get to choose where on our plate we get them, and also what we do with those peas. Those are our choices that God gives us as a parent. Now, as a parent, we have to understand also the kingdom of God. We have to understand God's essence, that God loves you so much that he thought you were worth dying for. God loves you so very much that he just, just vibes when, when, you, when you're just in joy. He just really just loves everything going on with you and is so proud of your art and so excited about who you are. If we understand God as that loving, excited parent for a child, and we understand God's realm exists everywhere in all time and all space, now we're going to start understanding what the kingdom of God is like. So let's talk about these two parables in particular. And we start with this first one. These are in the book of Mark. If you're following along, Mark chapter 4, where verses 26 through 34, there are two parables here. Probably told at different times, probably not told in succession, sitting in one point. Jesus said, the kingdom of God, this is verses 26 through 29, is as if someone would scatter seed on the ground and would sleep and rise night and day and the seed would sprout and grow and he does not know how. How is this like the kingdom of God? Well, let me tell you, the person is not the kingdom of God. The person is in the kingdom of God. The seed and everything in the environment represents the kingdom of God in this parable. So let me ask, anybody here start seeds from scratch and grow your own vegetables and stuff? Okay, we do, okay, as a family. Now, some of you, you, you might be able to figure this one out. When your tomato plant, which is a little seed and it's growing, it's about this tall, and I want, a, I want to get tomatoes, um, I should pull on it, right? So that way it grows faster. Why not? You're going to kill it. You're going to pull it out. It's, that's not how it works. And folks, I can't tell you how those seeds grow. 
I mean, I can tell you scientifically, I can tell you what they need to grow, I can tell you what the environment is, and I can even set up that environment, but it's entirely God making that happen because it's magic. What this parable tells us, because it goes on and talks about um, the earth produces of itself. God, God's doing this. God's creation makes this happen. First it produces the stalk, then it's got the head, then all of a sudden the grain comes out. There's some stuff we can learn from here that Jesus is saying about God's kingdom, about what is God's control, what is God's realm. And it comes down to this. Um, you can't make it grow. That's not up to you. It's not your job. It's not even within your scope of possibility. You have no capability to make God's kingdom grow. It just does. It goes on to say that um, it is imperceivable. Folks, you ever sat there and stared at a plant while it growed? Of course not. That's dumb. Because you're going to be bored for the next six weeks. But if you put a time-lapse camera on it, oh my goodness. Do you realize that when the sun goes down, the plant still grows? It hasn't stopped. It doesn't, oh, lights are off, I'm going to go sleep. The plant keeps growing. And it changes so little that you don't notice it. But it does change, doesn't it? My tomato plants that were this big, they're now about this big. Go in the right direction. In our two months, I'm gonna, we're going to have a bumper crop of tomatoes in our yard. Just how it works. But watching it grow, the easiest thing that we understand as people is you ever showed up and someone looks at your kids and goes, wow, they've gotten huge. And you're like, that's what happens when you feed them. <laughs> you don't notice. But the people who haven't seen them in a year do. And you understand that from another perspective when you watch another kid come at you, holy cow, you've gotten so big. Well, yeah, of course I have. That's what happens. We don't notice when we're standing right next to it. So when you're around the kingdom of God, you might not notice it happening. It's a constant growth. Just always happening, just little bit by little bit by little bit, but it keeps growing. And folks, the kingdom of God is inevitable. It really is. Um, who here has uh, weeded a flower bed recently? Anybody? Aren't you glad you never have to weed that ever again in your life? <laughs> you all know that's ridiculous because no matter what you do, growth will happen. That is what is the truth about this parable. And by the way, this parable is only found in Mark. It's not found in Matthew or Luke. It's only found here. So Mark is telling a story that Peter told him. This is a beautiful little piece that talks about the kingdom of God, that you're in it, and you see it, you don't understand it, but you know what to do with it when the time comes. There you go. That's beautiful. The second part, the second parable here, um, what can we compare the kingdom of God to, or what parable will we use for it? Rabbis often taught with an opening question, a relevant question, a question that uh, he wanted the people to listen to to answer. So he'd start off with the question, what can we compare this to? And he let people think, set up the t-ball for them to swing at. It's like a mustard seed, which when sown upon the ground is the smallest of all seeds on the earth. And when it is sown, it becomes the greatest of all shrubs and puts forth large branches so that birds come and make nests in it. Now, anyone ever seen a mustard seed? If you want to know what it's like, it's the size of the ball in your ballpoint pen. There are a lot smaller seeds than that. There are many other seeds that are smaller. So, Pastor, is the Bible lying to me? No. Jesus is not saying from a botanical uh, perspective that this is truly the smallest seed. Don't doubt it. No, he's saying, look how tiny that thing is. It is wee. It's not the size of a peach pit. It's not the size of a, of a kernel of corn. It's even way smaller than a tomato seed. Look at how tiny that thing is. Can anything good come out of something that small? Yeah, it grows in the grayest of shrubs. Now, folks, there are bigger shrubs. But if you've ever seen a mustard plant, it's like this big. Uh, one of the Roman historians, when experiencing a mustard plant down in Israel, 
looked at it and uh, said it is taller than a man on a horse. How can something that small grow into something that big that is so strong that birds make nests in it? It's almost like a tree. Folks, just so you know, in the Old Testament, when, some, when, something is, when they talk about a tree, it's often comparing it to a family. Okay, get there faster. <laughs> family tree, where look at everything that has grown from this one seed. But it's also looked at as a kingdom. A kingdom is that tree that spreads out and covers and gives shade to people. That is the beauty of this, what's going on here. What we need to know about God's kingdom in this parable is simply this. It might be the tiniest, the smallest of little faith pieces, the smallest little piece of hope that exists. But look what it grows into. Look how big this faith can be. Folks, that is what the kingdom of God is like. It is nothing but hope, faith, and patience. It is everything growing out of something small into something huge. May you be blessed this week, this year, to plant that tiny seed of faith and watch the kingdom of God grow in your life and your community. Amen? Amen. Let's stand and sing. Church, let us confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We are invited to stand, kneel, or sit, as is your tradition for prayer. Children praying, Lord, 
before the triune God to pray for our communities, ourselves, and our world. Nourish your faithful people through gifts of word and worship. Guide the church in listening to and interpreting your message of grace for this time and place in history. In your wisdom, lead us in expanding the reach of your love. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Nature sings your love in the morning and your faithfulness at night. Sustain the holy rhythms of creation, days and seasons, hibernation and activity, phases of the moon and tides of the sea. Let these patterns assure us of your constancy. Merciful God, receive our prayer. You raise the lowly and humble those in high regard. Raise up all who are victims of marginalization discrimination, and hate. As we anticipate Juneteenth, banish white supremacy and bigotry from the hearts of your people and remove the inclination toward anger and violence. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Tend to all who journey by faith and who wait with patience for the fulfillment of your healing promises, especially Vince Belinsky, Jim Berger, Don Buzzard, Linda Conrad, Sean Conrad, Janet Sear, Emma Cunningham, Liz Davies, Lee Igma, Debbie Ferment, Mark and Vicki Fisher, Lois Gilbert, Marsha Grace, Charlotte Haggerty, Phyllis Kennedy, Karen Laffer, Richard McGarvey, Pastor Mack, Jim and Nancy Price, Len Toy, Russ Wiest, Gary, our homebind members and friends of St. Paul's, Fred Beckwith, Pam Bittens, Richard Blackford, Laura Danielson, Brenda Dolwick, Julie Frick, Julie Feck, Patty and Ray Fiorelli, Christopher Gleckler, Sue Hart, Walt Hitchcock, Ron King, Dana Martinez, Tom Matthew, Joyce and Liz Morchauser, Chip Roward, Chris Saltonstall, Lee Schwartzfeger, Carol, Rob, and those we name aloud and in our hearts. John Coleman. Grant perseverance to people doing physical and occupational therapy, people living with mobility concerns, and people facing chronic pain. Merciful God, receive our prayer. As you have loved us, so let us love one another, empower fathers, stepfathers, grandfathers, adopted fathers, and chosen fathers to embody this gift of love for their children. Where these relationships are strained or broken, bring your comfort and peace. Merciful God, receive our, prayer. receive our prayers, O God, and come quickly to our aid through the power of the Spirit and the love of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> the peace of, the, of Christ be with you always, and also, also with, with you. you. <laughs> Let's share that peace. <laughs> oh, you're welcome. <laughs>
Let us pray together. Jesus, bread of life, you have set this table with your very self and called us to the feast of plenty. Gather what has been sown among us and strengthen us with this meal. Make us to be what we receive here, your body for the rest of the world. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, Almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Lord Jesus, the one who taught in parables and told us what the kingdom of God was like, was gathered with those disciples he taught. And there at supper he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave to them, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Every time you eat bread, every time, remember me. After supper he took the cup, and when he given thanks, gave it for all to drink, saying, Take and drink. This is my blood shed for you. It's a new covenant for the forgiveness of all your sins. Every time you drink wine, Every time, remember me. We remember our Lord in the bread, the wine, and the prayer that he taught us. Our, our Father, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as this in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Please be seated. A few instructions as we start. If you are coming from this side of the house, we invite you to come down the center aisle and start over at the choir loft and come to the middle. You can stand or kneel, whatever is your tradition. If you're coming from this side, please start here at the middle and go that direction to stand or kneel. We have both bread and a gluten-free option. Should you need it, please just ask. We also have uh, choices of either wine or grape juice in the trays, so we invite you to use whatever serves best to represent the blood of Christ for you. There's room at God's table for you, and all are welcome. Come and eat. i 
Just to bring something that's a worth that will bless your heart. I'll bring you more than a song, for a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper. I invite you to stand for the blessing. The body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ, strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray together. Jesus, bread of life, we have received from your table more than we could ever ask. As you have nourished us in this meal, now strengthen us to love the world with your own life. In your name we pray. Amen. A blessing from the book of Jeremiah. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. May you live into this promise of the Holy Trinity, one God who loves you, saves you, and claims you. Amen.
Our worship has ended. Now, now our, our servants begin. Go in peace. Christ is sending you. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.